Um, so I would like to in, uh, uh, introduce the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is um, Frank Holmes. Um, now, uh, nine months back, I moved my residence back to Asia. I no longer live in Canada. Um, before leaving Canada, I worked with uh, Mr. Holmes for, for five years. Mr. Holmes always insisted that our decisions be influenced by, not by our prejudices. Sorry. Our decisions should not be influenced by our prejudices. Uh, as someone who had immigrated from Canada and someone who truly disliked living in India, I did not want to believe that India and other poor countries would ever change. Mr. Holmes, being a believer in keeping us updated about different places, not through the eyes of the media, but through our own eyes, required all of us to do significant amount of international traveling, something I absolutely loved. During my visits to visit to Zimbabwe, I learned firsthand the effects of hyperinflation. Before I went, I was afraid I would meet bloodthirsty goons armed with AK-47s, as media had told me to believe about Zimbabwe. Instead, I found a very safe and friendly city of Harare. Traveling across the world, traveling across many countries in Africa, I started to understand that even that continent was starting to grow, in some cases, very drastically. Mr. Mr. Holmes, um, and I'm never sure if he had a hidden agenda behind this, he sent me many times to India. And I had to eventually accept that the change was in the wind in India. One other thing that Mr. Holmes always insisted on was about the importance of gratitude. To hear his views, I invite one of the most sought-after speakers and a very successful money manager, Mr. Frank Holmes. speaker for me, I have slides and I did all this prep work and for today I have no slides. So I'm going to try to walk you through uh, how I think and how I feel and there's a combination of going back and forth between what's in my mind and what's running around in my heart and the process uh, in doing that. And I think what's so important is the operative word of gratitude and thankfulness. And you all have your own special, unique journey. And so often, uh, the, the simple words of being oblivious and obvious. So how often here have you experienced that something was right in front of you and you missed it? Because you were then oblivious. But as time went down the road, you just took out the letter L and it was obvious. So all these experiences you have from traveling around the world or reading a book are so important in developing as a person. And one of the most significant factors of success, and I find in going around the world, is people that have gratitude and people that are thankful. Because when you are thankful, you are thoughtful. And when you are thoughtful, you then put your mind and your heart in a position of being self-aware, not self-absorbed. If you're driving your car and you're looking at your Blackberry, odds are you'll have an accident. What is that really saying is that you're self-absorbed. You're not self-aware. And life is now at risk because you're driving a car and you could kill yourself and someone else of this self-absorption over being self-aware. So often when people, 99% of car accidents happen to be with people who are self-absorbed. It could be from alcohol, it could be from their emotions, so caught up in some tragic in their life or they're upset and anger that they lose focus to check their mirrors as they're driving their car at 30 miles an hour or 60 miles an hour. So this thing happens, this experience also happens in business. And it happens in life, and business and life are actually connected. My background is, is my unique story 
because everyone is, has a unique story. And that's what's important to appreciate your unique story. Never take it for granted. Fill your heart with gratitude for your story, your experiences. Now, mine is evolved, and I think a couple things. One was my mother. She was a nurse, and she was a social worker in Toronto, downtown Toronto, Cabbage Town. And my father was an Anglican priest, so he was also a scholar. He read and spoke ancient Greek and Latin. Uh, I could tell you that Mozart's first piece of music was when he was four years old. He wrote Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, the melody. And he could tell you at any point who this musician was by listening. And so you grow up with this sort of experiences in life that you don't realize later in life they're so significant in your journey. What is your journey? Everyone here has a very special and unique journey. Too often, we can lose that balance. And I've turned around to always remind myself, and sometimes have to slap myself, Frank, you're not self aware. You're being self-absorbed. How am I aware of the room? How am I aware of people around? What is the audience? What is the people? What am I feeling? What am I thinking? All those parts can get into, um, go into space. How do you bring them back? So I've tried to crystallize in running a public company and uh, have to comply, like uh, my good friend Rick over here, uh, in the 40 Act of the Investment Advisor Act, and I have to comply with the most regulatory part of the world is, is the SEC has two divisions of, of regulatory oversight, and I have both. So how do you deal with that and still deliver performance? And how do you deal with, with, a, with a culture that really is not outward looking to the rest of the world, that you're investing in these countries and you're investing in gold, and the regulatory world actually finds great difficulty in this world of gold. Uh, they have great difficulty in really embracing other cultures around the world. Uh, how do you communicate? What you do? How do you? The whole process of thinking that through. So I've tried to crystallize it in running this business and, many, and winning with my team is many awards, many awards for performance and also for education. So it comes down to seven key values, values that I appreciate that I respect and I know other people do, such as initiative. We would call in sports the hustle factor. But does someone take the initiative when they have information to help someone else? And are they responsive? Because when people are truly showing the initiative to help someone else, then they're being thoughtful. Thoughtfulness means they're being self-aware. That is a good feeling I know for myself and I see success when other people are this functioning this way. So in managing different funds and having people from different backgrounds, from Poland, from Russia, from Africa, from Sweden, from Spain, from Latin America, they've all worked, uh, what, 12 people from China have worked at US Global, and right now there's two from mainland China. They have different cultures. They have different ways of looking at the world, which I have to learn to embrace, but at the same time, I have, when I use the words such as trust, trust in different cultures has a different meaning. But initiative and responsiveness, which creates trust, are the two pillars behind it, allow me to communicate to diversity. So that's, those two values are very, very important. And I have fired people because not, and they, and they could have IQs going to space and back they did not show responsiveness or initiative to other people in the company, and that started to breach this element of trust. No one ever complained when that person was asked to leave to go to the competition. It wasn't because they made a mistake of, of spelling something wrong or buying the wrong stock or communicating the wrong words or whatever. It was because they did not show the ability, and even though we coach and teach it, to have a greater self-awareness to be reaching out with initiative and responsiveness to each other. The other one is recognition. Recognition of any form of achievement, anything. So if someone takes the time and effort to um, do the heart walk to raise money for charity, they all get recognized in the company. If they're the top performing manager, they get recognized also. 
Last week we had what was called perfect attendance. I don't penalize people because they're late for work, I just reward those who always show up to work and put longer hours in. So I gave out, uh, last week was $48,000 in cash to this, my employees for this past six months of that, those people that showed this tremendous work ethic, this focused work ethic, and they had always these people show more initiative and responsiveness to each other. So these are values. And when you travel around the world, wherever you go, people have them and people respect them. And that's the important part of sort of these simple values to try to drive how you think and function because values and beliefs drive actions and actions drive results. It's a very simple A to B to C. And any time there's a distraction for something, then you can all of a sudden get a poor outcome. You can come back and you can find out that what was that person believing or valuing could have changed what they were doing. So these values of recognition of other people for any form of achievement, last week there was economics, but most important was one of my portfolio managers, Evan Smith. Evan Smith did the Iron Man. So we did a whole presentation on what does it take for this little metal. There's no money involved. And he had a sacrifice. Every day after work, 12 hour days, he would have to go work out for three hours a day for six days a week, for six months. That's 18 hours a week for six months for his body and his mind, his heart and his mind, to be able to stay in complete physical and mental focus for 12 hours and 15 minutes. So you have to compress this. What an incredible feat. So there's a whole celebration for his sacrifice for a little medal. And everyone, and to him, it was more important than competing with 2,800 people, is that his community of all the 80 employees came out to celebrate what he did. So we recognize that, and it's, and it's actually easy. There's another great line, smile, it's free. Smile, it's free. And when you smile, you release energy. And when you release energy, it shows you a positive energy. These are simple little things that, are, that go no matter where you are in the world. And one thing in traveling around the world is, I may not speak the language, but one thing I search for are eyes. I can see people's eyes, and I, and I can connect, and I, some people will not connect, those that will connect, it doesn't matter if they've got a scarf all over their face, those that will connect is smile. And a smile is what creates a connectivity. And the same thing is in a work setting, and the same thing, and what happens when you smile? You're no longer self-absorbed, you're actually self-aware. You're smiling for other people. You're smiling to connect. So at US Global, this is how we function. I have seven values to go out to be able to drive that process. And the other part was in, in running a business, I, I found that there was this propensity. Uh, and one of my key values is curious. Curious to learn and improve. So if you think of it, initiative and curiosity so curiosity to learn and improve means you're helping yourself and you're helping the company and you have to take the initiative to do it. There's an overlay here. So if you want to go and do something, are you going to improve? Are you, going to be, are you curious? Is it because I'm telling you you have to go do something or is it because you're really curious? Curiosity is such a key factor that I have found around the world that people that are high achievers, no matter what they do, they're just more curious. They just want to know, how does this work? How does this relationship work? What is going on here? How, what are the government policies that change uh, countries? Significant. Government policies are a precursor to change. Well, I, to discover that, I had to be curious. I had to be curious to go and read and understand big macro trends. Because that's my job. My duty as a money manager, and same with Rick, and same with Giant, is to make people happy. I'm not a stand-up comic, so I'm not going to make you laugh that way. But my job is that you trusted me with your money is to actually make you happy. And your expectations are that I'm going to do better than if you made another choice with that money. 
So if I don't do it, then I won't be successful. That's simple. My job is to make my shareholders happy. And how do I go about doing that? Because they've trusted me with their retirement dollars. And I try to explain this in great detail to my employees over and over. People will sacrifice their health for money. People will cheat for money. People will um, do stupid things. They'll marry for money, they'll divorce for money. Uh, it's, it's incredible to watch the stupidity over this thing of money. It's remarkable. So when someone turns around and gives you their money, there's, a, there's an audience here, they all have, you all have different emotions attached to this element of money. But I can tell you, when you give that money to our funds, there's a huge element of trust and a huge element of expectations, and it's very emotional. It's factual, it's a number, but behind you to give that money there, there has to be emotions. So there has to be the heart and the mind. And too often in business, people just take the money and give back some other type of service. So how do you, how do you get people to be curious to understand and learn? Learn how to deal with a customer, learn how to pick a stock better, learn how to learn a new technology, et cetera. So curious to learn and improve is a very important set of values. And this, I thank my mother for. So you should all be thankful and grateful and remind, my mother is now an angel. And how do I remind, remember her every time I see eight? Because she worked eight days a week. Remember the Beatles song? Eight days a week. So my license plates are 888. Because this is the way she functioned and she was always curious and she was always solutions orientated. But to be that way, as I remember so well, was this thankfulness and gratitude. And so often when I end up my presentations, I say that, that I believe that money is not a number and amount, but it is an attitude and its umbilical cord is gratitude. I've just seen so often happy and wealthy people, I said the word happy, with their wealth, their achievements, how they've overcome their challenges, and I've also seen miserable people that have lots of money. And I want to take the person that actually has less money but is happier with themselves and what they've done. And they have a set of qualities that are very they're simple values. And this element of gratitude is very important. And now it comes back to investing, because that's my business, and it is, MIT has come up with research. And, uh, and the research is re regarding people that have a greater degree of optimism. Not foolhardy, not just blind faith, et cetera, but they're more optim optimistic, and that is they're, they're more curious to find a solution to an issue. That's what they're just more curious. And when they're in this element, they actually find more opportunities. The other element that comes with this idea of gratitude is so important and in individual relationships. There's a wonderful book written by Blanchard and a, and a doctor named Spencer called The One Minute Manager. Anyone read the book? It's really quite simple. Uh, my mother simplified even more than reading the whole book. She said it's only 18 inches between a pack in, pat in the back and a kick in the pants. And you need three pats in the back for every kick in the pants, otherwise you'll grow up with a twitch and dysfunctional. So what the book has simplifies in this model is that you are a good person. You are a good person. But your behavior is not the best. So you must correct that behavior. At the same time, you had to find a way to compliment the person saying, you are a good person, and that was spectacular uh, actions and performance and behavior, and that's what the team needs or you need. It's the t now, for you to be able to do that, to do that, that is, pat someone in the back, in addition to kick someone in the pants, in a very highly performance oriented critical, regulatory world is tough. Because in our world, we do nothing but make these state statements and the compliance departments have even grown bigger, you're in violation. This is bad, that is bad, this is bad, is that. There's no time in the 24 hours a day to find a compliment. And if there's no time to find a compliment, that means you're not taking the time to have gratitude and thankfulness. So in a business setting, in a even a professional uh, sports team, 
it's always trying to find out why you didn't score, why this went wrong, that wrong, this wrong. And it can have a huge detrimental impact on your health. Not only the health, the health of you as an individual, but the health of a corporation. And there's lots of research since, since the year 2000, billions of dollars have gone into this research of the connectivity, the neuroplasticity to learn new things in your mind, and the same thing, the connectivity to your heart. You can read uh, like one of the top new sites for maintaining your, your um, building new neurons is Luminosity, I believe it's called. And they've got games to turn around and stimulate your brain to continuously be invigorated. But to do that, you have to actually be curious. You need the element of curiosity, not forced to do it. So this research coming back to MIT, and what they noticed was that this teams, winning sports teams, have a different intelligence. It's an emotional intelligence from the heart because they pat each other in the back five times more than the losing teams. They take, they have the time, they make the time and effort to complement and encourage others more often. That's what they do. It's real simple. They complement and encourage more often. Now, it doesn't mean they don't critique because they want to win, but they still spend more time, so therefore they have to be self-aware. Self-aware, not self-absorbed. Not into a pity party, but in a solution party, or a witty party, not a pity party. So these elements are, I find, are so important when you're curious to learn, improve, and travel around the world. And the other part, if you subscribe to, I have a blog that goes out to about 40,000 people in 70 countries. And, uh, and a key factor here is, is how I believe it grew is because we do a SWOT analysis. Now, SWOT analysis, the acronyms stand for strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And if you did your MBA here, or go to MBA school, usually strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats in that model is the strengths and weaknesses are something that are internal and opportunities and threats are external. What we've done is make it more like a pro sports game film analysis. What are the strengths and weaknesses of last week that impacted the fund performance? And what are the opportunities and threats of data coming out next week, a G's 20 meeting, that could impact it? And never more than three sentences. No run-on sentences, no garbage. Be succinct, think about it. Be think, so therefore, to do that, you have to be thoughtful. You have to be thinking. And you have to do an honest analysis of what are the strengths and weaknesses of the past week and what are the opportunities and threats for next week. That model shows up as populated every Friday and goes out and is written by the investment team. That process helps you learning. It's a very key element of learning because learning takes two ways. It takes explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge. And explicit knowledge is like getting your driver's license. Does that mean you're a good driver? I don't think so. Tacit knowledge is what assures that you become a better driver because you're learning, you're building the neurons in your mind that relate to your motor muscle memory. But it takes time. Professional athletes, and everyone's read the book Outliers, there's a whole chapter on this, it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert. The, the pilot that landed the plane in the harbor of New York City two years ago had over 10,000 hours of flying. Only a month later, a couple bozos flew right past Minneapolis to Buffalo and realizing they'd overflown where they're supposed to land. They didn't have the 10,000 hours. So a doctor's going to operate on you or someone's going to give you this very special high precision information, you want to make sure they at least have 10,000 hours. And they found for professional athletes that they too have to put in 10,000 hours. The Beatles, because they played in Germany every night, they put in their 10,000 hours, something like 12 years faster than any other band. And that's what allowed them to be more sustainable. They had built this new tacit knowledge of, of, of just continuous focused effort. So two ways of learning. Now you become a, an accomplished driver. You know all the rules in Canada and you know how to drive well up and down through mountains and to back how to back your car in the snow you've got you're really accomplished 
I'm gonna pack you up now sending to London, England. And you have to drive stick shift. And you have to now learn all the explicit knowledge, all the signs all over. You have to, outside of stop signs, they have different signage. If you don't know them, you'll get a fine. And by the way, in England, there's cameras everywhere, so they just continuously send you tickets. You didn't read the sign properly, they'll see how you conduct your car. So with that, you have to have knowledge. You need this explicit knowledge, and then you have to go and practice driving on the opposite side of the road. And if you have to drive stick shift, you're gonna to have to learn a new sort of motor muscle memory. This is what's important in this idea of always learning and being curious to learn. That's what separates you. So now you've got this explicit task of knowledge and at US Global, I'm a big believer that the SWOT analysis is the explicit knowledge. The tacit knowledge is you went to India. And what did you discover? Because last time you wrote about the strengths and weaknesses, did you talk about any progress? Were you concerned about progress? Did you see it now evolve? Because you went there. You didn't have to, re don't read about it, you go there. Because there's a thing about feelings. And so often they're not, they're taken for granted, but feelings are so, so important in decisions. Good decisions and bad decisions. Your passion should go into your processes. You should still have this passion, this curiosity to learn and improve all the time comes from the heart. You actually, the mind does it, but the heart drives it. It comes from the heart. And there's a wonderful book called The Wisdom of, uh, it was called, um, sorry, uh, Dominic Moises, and it's, Dominic Moises wrote a book, and it's, let me see if you recall the exact title. Um, it has to do with, with the emotions of emerging markets. And the emotions of emerging markets and what he found was that, that, that these emotions of fear and hope. And what I found in the travels around the world, it did not matter if the mother, what the, what the color of their skin was. And it did not matter what her religion was. She always wanted something better for her kids. Commonality. And she all, they all the same DNA of love and nurture and wanted the best for their kids. But what happens in Dominic Moise's research is that if people felt fear, then the government came up with policies that were fear to were actually motivate and inspire even more fear. If there was hope, then the economies expanded. And the worst is when there was humiliation. Whenever a group, an entity felt humiliated by the rest of the world or by the society, then all of a sudden they rebelled. And most terrorist groups came from societies where there was humiliation. Now how do you relate to this in our world? A married couple and the husband is public and having affairs. How do you think the wife thinks? Do you think she's just upset, frustrated, give me a divorce, I wanna go away? Or do you think she feels humiliated? If she feels humiliated, does she want 50-50? Does she? She doesn't want 50-50. She doesn't want half the photographs and half your bank account. She wants you killed. She wants you to feel the pain so great. So we see this every day. We hear about it in our communities, etc. this whole element of, of emotions taken over when someone has to feel humiliated. Rather than a learning experience, and a horrible learning experience, if, the, if that negative emotion goes to humiliation in a whole community, you get terrorists. It's really interesting research. And he talks about landing in, in India and seeing nothing but extreme poverty, economics, but there was hope. Hope of something's gonna be better. Hope. And they could see buildings going up. They could see new cars. They could see this growing. There's something around them, but there was more hope, even though there was such great poverty. And there was change taking place. There's some factors I can comment that, that fast track this change. But there was change taking place. You landed in London, England, just after the, the tube was bombed. What do you think was there? Do you think there was hope or do you think there was fear? Fear. 
You think in the U.S. when you have homeland security and all the rules, etc., all that stuff comes out of fear. Whistleblowing to the degree that it's gone, all those, those, that was a Russian model to control their society was whistleblowing. Speak to anyone that grew up in the 60s and 70s in Russia, and they'll tell you, especially when they were Jewish, they couldn't talk about being Jewish, they had to hide that they are being Jewish, and otherwise, other people would turn around and, and they'd have make allegations on them, and the KGB would be knocking on their door. I had many friends when I was a kid growing up in Toronto that I heard these experiences, they moved over. So now we have whistleblowing. Well, all this stuff is out of fear. So right now, you see this world where there's hope, where there's policies and government policies because there's emotions of hope. Very, very important. And how do you, within this context of, of what's so much fear in policies, have hope? Because if you have hope, then you will see opportunity. And if you have hope, then you'll be healthier. Most people that are healthier are more curious to learn and improve about their health. And they're more hopeful about their health. They're more curious to learn and improve about relationships. We all make mistakes, but they're curious to learn how to rebuild relationships because there's more hope in their heart. Well, to get hope in your heart, another key factor in our society is to have more gratitude. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Be thankful is to be thoughtful. And to be thoughtful is what helps you your health and it also helps your wealth. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.